Oh man, that was pretty gross. Just finished the second of two 60 minute power tests and the one I just did was fasted and I had a low carb dinner last night. The point of these has been to compare fasted versus fueled training or all out power efforts as well, just to see what the difference is and how fueling strategies can change it. So I did record a little intro after I'd finished that last power test, uh, but I couldn't really speak, uh, so I <laughs> thought I needed to record another one now. I haven't looked at the numbers yet, so we're gonna go into that together and just see what it's like and how it really can change, or maybe it doesn't. <laughs> um, so hopefully it'll be interesting and useful for you and for me. So I'll catch you in a minute. All right, so what's up nutrition nerds and welcome back to another video. As you can probably tell, I'm less sweaty and ready to go through some data. This video all came about because I was trialing the Super Sapiens Continuous Glucose Monitor and I wanted to see what my glucose levels did during two 60 minute power efforts and how it affected performance. And it threw up some super interesting results. If you're interested in my review of the CGM, by the way, I put a link in the description and at the top of the screen for you, not sponsored or affiliated. Anyway, I wanted to know what happened and whether I performed better in one scenario or another. Now there should be a clear difference between the two scenarios. If you look at the evidence, you'll see quite clear themes into fasted exercise and performance. Usually the fasted groups do a lot worse. To prepare for my fasted effort, I did a short swim the night before with a few intervals and followed that up with a low carb dinner. The next morning I had water and a caffeine tablet and then did my test. Now I felt that the caffeine was important for two reasons. Number one, caffeine helps with performance and I wanted to see how far I could push myself. And number two, caffeine may increase your ability to metabolize fat and use it as fuel. So again, that could be helpful in this scenario. For my well fueled effort, I did the same pre-test swim the night before. I had breakfast a few hours before the actual test and then started sipping on a caffeinated carb drink about 45 minutes out, had a 25 gram carb gel about 30 minutes before and then continued to sip at my drink throughout the 60 minutes. This was more like a race nutrition setup and it wasn't strictly necessary for a 60 minute power test as I wasn't worried about bonking when I went into it well fueled. But I wanted to test things properly and the carb drink during the effort should help with performance too through the carb mouth rinsing mechanism. Now, up until this point, I hadn't ever done a 60 minute power test before, so I knew there would be an element of learning going into this. Because of that, I decided to do my well fueled effort first to minimize the risk that the combination of a low carb approach and no familiarization to the protocol severely impacted the fasted effort. A week after the fueled effort, I did the fasted effort at the same time of the day. During both tests, I didn't look at my glucose data or my average power. I used trainer road to keep me roughly where I thought I needed to be and aim to just build over the 60 minutes both times. So that's the backstory. Let's get into the data, shall we? I guess let's start by going straight into the numbers. If you've seen my Super Sapiens video, then you'll know these numbers already, but don't worry, we won't spend too much time on this because it's everything around it which is much more interesting. So my average power for the first 60 minute power test where I was well fueled was 250 watts. Now I'll be honest and say I was a little disappointed in this, but as a first effort for a 60 minute power test, I won't grumble too much. My average power for the second test where I was fasted was, drum roll, we have got a drum roll this way, 249 watts. So uh, not really much difference. Now I wasn't really expecting this. When you look at the evidence around this sort of thing, then really my average power for the fasted effort should have been quite a lot lower than my fueled effort, but it wasn't. So of course, I wanted to know why, and there are a few potential reasons for this. We're gonna go into my glucose data in a moment because that might hold the answer. But first we'll run through some other potential reasons first. Have you ever done a true 60 minute power test? Because man, they're uncomfortable. And the first reason might be that I just wasn't used to the discomfort and intensity of a 60 minute power test. Having never done one before, I wasn't sure what to expect or exactly how to pace it. So my well fueled effort might have been hampered by this and conversely by doing it again a week after, I was able to perform as well as my initial test even though I was fasted because I was able to tolerate the discomfort and deal with it all better. And usually in studies you'll find that participants undergo a familiarization protocol for this exact reason. 
Temperature may also have played a part in my performance between the two tests. I wasn't quite ready for just how hot or uncomfortable a 60 minute power test is, and it may have just generally been a warmer day when I did the first one. For my second test, I opened all of the windows and made sure that I had a draft. Looking at the temperatures afterwards via my Garmin, they were 24 degrees during the well-fueled effort and 20 degrees during the fasted effort. It is well documented that temperature can affect performance and this difference may have contributed to a worse performance in the first test or better performance in the second test or a combination of both. Now the length of the test might have also been a factor here. I had hoped that by the end of it, I would have been really struggling and getting close to bonking or actually bonk. And although it was nasty, I don't think I was quite there, which suggests I still had sufficient carbohydrates left. I had hoped to bonk so that I could see what my glucose levels did and whether the CGM that I was wearing at the time could pick it up. However, I don't think I did get to that point and so the overall test length may have been a reason why my test results were similar. Although it felt mentally harder, I still wasn't at my nutritional limit, or at least sufficiently to show a difference between the tests. Had it been for another 50 minutes, I think it might have started to make a real difference. All right, now let's get into another area to analyze and one that's a bit more in depth. So I mentioned at the start that I did these tests while using the Super Sapiens CGM. If you haven't watched my video on that and don't know what it is or how it works, it might be worth watching that to get some context. But for now, let's assume you've watched it or know enough to go off. Or simply don't care and that's fine too. Now, the CGM measures the level of glucose in your interstitial fluid and reports it via a live Bluetooth link or stores it to review after your session. I chose not to look at my glucose data during both 60 minute power tests because I didn't want it to mentally affect my performance. Now, these are my glucose readings for the two tests. And if you don't already know, before I tell you which is which, I want you to try and guess the correct one. On the one, you see a pretty steady rise throughout. And on the other, you see it start super high, drop super low, and then climb again. Now, this is which is which here, and I'm interested to know if you got this right. On its own, this glucose data is interesting, but let's link it to my performance and how, as I mentioned at the start, that I expected my well-fueled effort to be much, much better. So now let's add my power profile because this is where it starts to get much more interesting and what we really want to talk about. The power profile for my fasted effort was what I would expect and hope for for this type of test. Essentially starting a bit lower than you finish, gradually working into it and working harder. You can see that pattern here in my power profile and also in my glucose readings too. By the way, that little drop is where I freewheeled overall for about 20 seconds as I just felt I needed to. Even with that accounted for, my average power was 249 because before and after it, I rode it about 254 watts. Now, if we look at the power profile for my well-fueled effort, you'll see it doesn't look the same. What happened was I started at where I finished in terms of average watts, but near the start, I had to drop my power down because I felt that things were too hard. I then tried to work into it again, but again, I had to drop it because it was just too tough. Then I managed to get into it and gradually build again over the second half. Now you can see that where my glucose readings dropped and came up seems to correlate with the period when I felt it was harder and I had to drop the power and then felt better so I could get into it. And just to remind you, I didn't know what my glucose levels were doing at this time. So there seems to be a correlation in my performance here and the timing is really important. It could be that that drop in my glucose levels might have been a contributing factor to why my performance tests were so similar in their results. Now the discussion that we need to have is whether you should have consumed carbohydrates in the hour before you exercise, because historically there's been some concern about that. In 1979, there was a study that demonstrated that carbohydrates in the hour before exercise caused a performance decrease compared to exercise in a fasted state. The potential mechanism is that the carbohydrates would cause your blood sugar to increase which would trigger a release of insulin to counter that. That process is combined with the mechanism that commonly happens when you first start exercising, and that's a small transient drop in blood sugar. And this combination causes your blood sugar to drop even lower than it normally would, termed rebound hypoglycemia, 
which potentially causes that worsening in performance. There's actually a few different theories into the exact mechanisms at play, and it is a little bit more complicated. But overall, those findings led to widely promoted guidance to avoid carbohydrates in the hour before exercise, and you'll still hear that to this day. However, more recent studies in 1999 and early 2000s investigated the mechanism and prevalence of hypoglycemia in athletes and the link to performance. There were multiple examples of where athletes experienced this rebound hypoglycemia, but it didn't seem to change their performance. And in most cases, athletes weren't actually aware of the changes in their blood sugar. That is, their actual blood glucose level did drop, but the athletes didn't report any differences in perceived effort or display a worsening of performance. So fast forward to today and current sport nutrition guidance suggests that in general, carbohydrates in the hour before exercise can be useful for performance for a number of different reasons and should be well tolerated. So carbs, 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 eat them all, they're good for performance. However, you will still see some caveats along the lines of some athletes may experience significant symptoms associated with rebound hypoglycemia, and these athletes should be easily identified by changes in their performance. As such, the sort of advice that you would give would be things like experiment with the timing of carbohydrate intake before exercise, do some sprints in warm up to increase liver glucose output, experiment with higher carb intake in the pre event snack, and experiment with the glycemic index of the carbohydrates consumed. So bringing it back to my results and my glucose data, the question is, was I affected by this rebound hypoglycemia? I'd love to know what you think after hearing all of this. Are there too many confounding factors to put it down to blood sugar? Or do you think it was due to that drop in blood sugar? For me, the bottom line is that I need to do more testing and I'm not sure if I'm excited about that or not. It could lead to some interesting findings, but it's more 60 minute power tests. But I think it's important for me to test this and hopefully it'll be interesting for you guys too. We're gonna to pick this up more in the future, so make sure you press that subscribe button and the notification icon to stay up to date. And if you're interested in more testing videos, I recently compared my Garmin VO2 Max to a real lab test, and you can watch that here.